morning, church. Good morning. It is so wonderful to be here with you. Thank you, Pastor Scott, for, for inviting me. Um, as, as Pastor Scott said, I am a co-founding pastor of a church uh, down just down the road in D.C., Grace Capital City. My husband and I moved up from Atlanta in 2015 and, and launched Grace Capital City in uh, 2016, just a few years after Pastor Scott and Amber launched the foundry here in 2013, and it's just a real honor to be here with you today. And and as Pastor Scott said, by training, I am a a climate scientist, and actually Baltimore is a big part of my story in that because whenever we moved up here first to D.C., my first job was actually here at Johns Hopkins. I was a postdoc in their their Earth and Planetary Science Department and would make the trek of 95 every day uh, to come uh, uh, to Johns Hopkins to study God's incredible creation. And so it's just really wonderful to, again, make that trek again today and be here with you all. So um, last week, we celebrated Easter. And it was a really wonderful day for us at Grace Capital City. Pastor Scott was telling me what a wonderful day it was here at the Foundry as well. And and at GCC, at Grace Capital City, we spent our time in, in Romans. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, where Paul calls Jesus the firstborn among the brothers and sisters. He calls Jesus the firstborn of the resurrection life among the brethren of believers. And the significant thing here is that Jesus being named the firstborn, that implies that there's a secondborn and a thirdborn and a fourthborn. And so we get this picture that that with Jesus' resurrection, it's a whole family coming back to life. Paul is telling us that Jesus, as the firstborn, is making a way for all of the brothers, all of the sisters to receive life, that abundant, everlasting life that Jesus came to give. That is the good news of Easter, that the power of the resurrection doesn't stop with Jesus. It extends to all of us. Well, today, I want to explore how Jesus' work on the cross doesn't stop there either. You see, elsewhere in Romans, in chapter 8, Paul reveals that Jesus' work isn't just about us as a family being redeemed, of humanity coming back to life. Paul actually reveals that God is actually up to something even bigger. So, So let's take a look. Let's take a look in our passage today. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 24. So it says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. We know that uh, not by its own choice, We know that the whole of creation, uh, hold on, let me just take a step back. Um, Creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who are, have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. We were saved. So Paul's got a lot going on there. It's a, it's a meaty passage. There is a lot to chew on there. And so I want to hone in on, on two specific points. Specifically, I want to draw out that, that Paul is talking about first, this picture that Paul paints. He paints God's plan of redemption. It's bigger than we ever imagined. Christ's resurrection and our redemption through that actually has cosmic consequences 
It's cosmic in scope. And second, God is inviting us to participate as agents in his plan for the renewal of all things. We see that God's plan is bigger than we imagined. It's cosmic in scope. And God is inviting us to join him as a redeemed family to participate in what he is doing. So let's first explore how God's plan is cosmic in scale. In in chapter or in verse 21, it says that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We also see this elsewhere in scripture. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Through Christ, God is reconciling all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We can see this in in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, where, where John the Revelator writes that he saw the one sitting on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And that's really important to note. It's important to note, this isn't just a, a wipe the slate clean kind of new. This isn't a a start over from scratch kind of new. He isn't saying, behold, I make all new things. He's saying, behold, I am making all things new. What the Bible is telling us is that God's plan is to renew everything, everything that he has made, all of his creation. It's, of course, includes us, but it's not just us as humanity that Jesus sets free. It's this renewal that extends to all of God's creation. And it is this, that creation has been waiting and eager expectation for. In in verse 22, Paul says, creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth, just as a mother is groaning in expectation for the promise of holding her precious child in her arms. Creation is groaning for the promise of renewal. It, It groans together in a chorus for the opportunity to be set free. What we see is that God's plan is bigger than we thought. His plan, of course, is again for us, but it's bigger than that. God has a vision for all of his creation to share in the glory of Christ's resurrection. Second, God's plan for renewal of creation, it includes us. (laughs) He invites us to be participants and agents in this cosmic work that he is doing. Verse 19 says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Let's unpack this a bit. What does it mean for something to be revealed? I don't know about you, but whenever I think about something being revealed, I think about something that is is coming out of darkness and and coming into the light. I think about, you know, for something to be revealed, it implies that it must already exist. You know, it must already exist, but it's hidden. It's obscured somehow. And, And that's what we get a sense of what Paul is getting at here. He's saying that creation is waiting for us, the children of God, to step back into a position or a place that was once evident, that was once obvious, but but now is is hidden, is obscured somehow. We see that the implications of us being redeemed, of us being transformed and being set free, we see that this is a critical part of God's plan for creation itself to then share in the glory of Christ, to be transformed, for it to be set free from its bondage to decay. We are a critical part of God's plan, and and we see that the fate of creation is somehow connected with ours. But why is this? Why why, why is Paul saying that that we've got such power? This is a lot of power that we have, that he's saying that we have. And so to understand this, we really need to go back to the beginning. (laughs) We need to go back and look at Genesis chapter 1, where God gives what many consider, um, he gives 
what to human hind, what many consider our, our first commission, the first commission to, to humankind. And so in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, and this is from the message, it says, God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, making them reflecting our nature so that, so that they can be responsible for the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the cattle, and yes, even the earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. We see that that God, he made us in his image. And, And what he does then after he has just finished making his incredible creation, his incredible masterpiece, what does he do? He pauses and he places it in, in our hands. He places it in our hands. He essentially is saying, here, you take it. I trust you. Take my masterpiece. He appoints us as stewards and caretakers of his creation. Guys, this is a big deal. Let's really consider this. This is an awesome assignment that God has given us to care for everything that he has lovingly made. This includes all of the created world. It includes all of us and everything else in it. And this is actually a key part of our identity as being humans made in the image of God. Being made in the image of God, it means that that we are to be caretakers. He made us in his image so that we could steward everything that he has made. And so it is with this first commission <laughs> that God gives us that, that yokes the fate of all creation to ours. We are his stewards, his regents of all of his handiwork, and this carries a great authority and a great responsibility. This connection and this authority, it can be used for, for better or for worse, and it can be used for good or for ill. And, and that's why when we, when in Genesis chapter three, we fast forward in verse 17, this is why following Adam and Eve's disobedience, God says, cursed is the ground because of you. Curse is the ground because of our disobedience. That's because God placed his creation in our hands to take care of. And when when we fell, creation fell also. And this is exactly what Paul is referring to in, in verse 20 when he writes, for the creation was subjected to frustration. And in other translation, it says futility, subjected to futility, to decay, not by its own choice, but by the one who subjected it to it. The fate of all creation, it's tied somehow to us, to our choices, to our actions, because God placed it in our care. And this is why creation is waiting in eager expectation for the revealing of the children of God so that it might too be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and the glory of the children of God. We see that when we look at Genesis 3 together with Romans 8, we discover that our actions as humans being made in the image of God imbued with this great authority It has the power, our actions have the power to sow life or death, renewal or decay, freedom or bondage, not only for ourselves personally, but again, for all of creation, for everyone and everything in it. Can we just sit here for a minute? This is a really incredible authority that God has given us. As children of God, you carry the image of God And with that, you carry the power to sow life or death. You carry the authority to speak or impart life or death. We have to be aware of this. We have to be awake to this, that this is a deep dignity and a deep trust that God has given us to steward, to steward life or death in our own lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of our community, and yes, even in in all of creation. 
Now, if, if you come drive through my neighborhood in D.C., what you'll see is a bunch of little red signs through many of my neighbor's yards and along the boulevard, um, these little red signs. And, and on those signs in big block letters, it says, no more diesel bus fumes. <laughs> No more diesel bus fumes. And when these started popping up, these little red signs started popping up in the neighborhood, I wasn't really sure what all of that was about. And so what I did was what everyone would do in that same situation, I Googled it. <laughs> I Googled it to see if Google knew what was going on, because I certainly didn't. And, and what I found was that these no more diesel bus fumes signs were, were about the northern bus barn. <laughs> the Northern Bus Barn. It is this giant garage for city buses that is right in the middle of our neighborhood, takes up two city blocks and is a couple blocks from my house. I had driven past it day after day, hadn't paid much attention to it at all. And, and what happens at the Northern City Bus Barn is, is that when hundreds of buses, when the city buses are done with their route, when they're done with their run, they, they come and park at the city bus barn, at the northern bus barn to refuel um, to, before they go back out on, on that run again. And so what happened was, is that day and night, because of the northern bus barn in our neighborhood, all these buses from all over the city were driving through <laughs> and across our neighborhood. And it turns out that these diesel-powered buses, as they are traveling through our neighborhood, they're emitting a lot of traffic exhaust. <laughs> they're emitting a lot of diesel fumes that are, that are filled with really bad, toxic stuff. Compounds like nitrogen oxides that form ground-level ozone, which are a really powerful lung irritant. Particulate matter called PM2.5, that is essentially these microscopic particles of soot that are invisible to our eyes. And, and it is this invisible microscopic soot that it was filling our air in our neighborhood as the diesel buses rolled in day and night, day and night across our streets and through, through our neighborhood. Now, I, I don't know about you, but whenever I think of soot, I kind of get an image of like from Mary Poppins or, or Charles Dickens of these chimney sweeps just covered in soot. But the thing is, is that, that even though the soot today is so tiny that we can't see it in the air, it doesn't mean that it's not harmless. Because what happens is with the soot, because it is so small, when we breathe it in, it, it travels through our bloodstream and it can lodge in our lungs and in our hearts and on our brains, wreaking, wreaking havoc on our bodies. Medical research shows that soot is linked to a raft of, of health problems, not only from asthma and, and lung disease, but also heart disease and even dementia. Worldwide research shows that it is linked to the deaths of 9 million people each year. And if we put that in context, that is more than, than AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, even war and violence combined. Even here in the U.S., 20,000 people die early each year because of breathing dirty air. And again, putting that in context, we think of what we've just gone through with COVID. This is, this is a pandemic scale problem that we're experiencing every year from dirty air. Even though we can't see it, it doesn't mean that the problem has gone away. Far from it. And, and the real tragedy of, of air pollution, and this is the same with, with climate change too, is that it's the health and lives of the most vulnerable in our communities, the most overlooked that is, is threatened most. This includes our children, the elderly, the poor, pregnant women, people of color, and, and many, many more. Many of the people that, by scripture, Jesus calls us to, to love and to serve. Um, as a mother, uh, I've got a, a 10 month old son at home, Josiah, who keeps us really busy. Um, 
this matters to me because this also includes our infants and our babies. Before our children are even born, before they even take their first breath, they can be impacted by this. By, by breathing unhealthy air while pregnant, it has a similar effect as what smoking while pregnant can have. It's linked to premature birth. It's linked to lower birth weights. It's even linked to, to stillbirth. And if you look worldwide, when it comes to what causes newborns to, to die in their first month of life, 20% of newborns that that happens to is due to air pollution. This is nearly half a million newborns each year worldwide. Guys, we carry the power to sow life or death. And if we're truly to call ourselves defenders of life, we must defend life against all of its threats. That includes making sure everyone has clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, a safe climate to thrive in. It includes all of that. If you look back to John Calvin, what he wrote back in, in 1536, he says, we have a moral responsibility to hand down creation to the next generation just as we received it or better cultivated. Just as we received it or better cultivated. This is our moral responsibility. And guys, the good news is, is that with God's help, we can do this. We can absolutely do this. This is what I see in my work every day is that we can do this because we are people, again, made in the image of God, who is the creator of the universe. He's the ultimate creator and innovator. He has imbued us with that creativity that he used to create the entire world. And he... he leads us in amazing ways to come up really with really creative, innovative solutions to ensure that we can have that healthy environment. The truth is, is that we already have the tools, we have the technology, we have the know-how to, to solve these problems, to clean up our air, to address climate change. And the thing is, is we just have to choose to put them in place. <laughs> we just have to choose to act. And as us as the church, we have to just choose to take back that mantle of being good stewards of God's creation. Another piece of good news is that the solutions to cleaning our air are many of the same solutions that are needed to address the climate crisis. When we swap out our diesel buses for zero emission buses, that not only clears, cleans the air that we breathe and our children breathe, it also removes a source of carbon dioxide of these heat trapping gases that are fueling climate change. Guys, when we say yes to the assignment that God has given us as stewards, our efforts <laughs> are multiplied. <laughs> They're multiplied. The benefits of our good stewardship, it's multiplied. And, and that's why The Lancet, one of the most respected medical journals out there that I know many of you are in the medical profession that you may read, it's why The Lancet calls climate change one of the greatest opportunities to advance health ever. It's why Forbes calls climate change one of the greatest opportunities to advance innovation ever. Good environmental stewardship sows life in multiple different areas. It is a multi benefit multiplier. And when we accept that invitation of God to participate in his plan for the healing and restoration of creation, the truth is, is that we ourselves <laughs> receive healing and restoration in the process. As we reclaim that mantle of stewardship, we restore the relationship that God had originally intended between us and creation. A relationship where as we take care of creation, creation in turn provides for us and takes care of us. And God is honored and glorified in the process. And finally, our, our stewardship actions are, are actually prophetic. They're prophetic. They are prophetic acts that point towards Christ's coming kingdom, where all things in heaven and on earth are reconciled in the name of Jesus. 
my friend Caleb Haynes, who has this really incredible book called Garbage Theology. <laughs> you should check it out. He's a bivocational pastor and waste manager. He says, when we recycle and compost, we are actually declaring that nothing in God's kingdom is waste. <laughs> When we use our, our consumer power to choose products and cars and energy that's less polluting, we are actually pointing towards the ultimate healing and restoration of both ourselves and all of creation. As we create green spaces and remove sources of pollution that are cited intentionally in, in black and brown neighborhoods due to redlining, the legacy of redlining and other racist practices, we are actually participating in God's restorative justice. And with each new tree that we plant, we get a glimpse of that restored Eden that has the center, the tree of life at its center, that Revelation 22 says, the tree of life, its leaves bring healing to all the nations. That is what we are participating in. And so I, I want to I end with this, and, and band, you can come on back up. I want to end with this. That as the children of God, God has given us first an awesome assignment <laughs> to take care of all that he has made, all of his creation, everyone and everything in it. He's given us an awesome authority <laughs> with the power to sow life or to sow death. He has given us an awesome invitation <laughs> to partner with him in ushering in his kingdom and the renewal of all things. Church today, let us say yes. <laughs> let us say yes and amen to all of these things, to this awesome assignment, this awesome authority, and this awesome invitation. Let's say yes to what God is inviting us into. And so with that, let us pray.